With all the things the Bible says that we're going to have in heaven, is there anything you and I are going to have to do without? (laughs) Well, absolutely, and that's what we're going to talk about today on Back to the Bible. Hi, I'm Woodrow Kroll, along with Tammy Weisert. We have some very special friends in our studio today who are part of our daily Bible study. And I'm glad that you've joined us as well for today. Now, we're nearing the end of our personal Bible study in the book of Revelation. Just a couple of days left, Tammy. We've been at this, uh, what, eight weeks now. And it's time to uh, just stick with it a couple more days so we can wrap up this series on a positive note today and tomorrow, talking about what God has in our future. Now, today, Tammy, I want to talk about the things we have to do without in heaven. I know that sounds a little strange because a lot of people define heaven as having everything you want. But the Bible doesn't say we have everything we want. In fact, it doesn't say we have everything. There are some things we have to do without in heaven. Okay, yesterday, Dr. Kroll, I mentioned that just this whole idea of heaven and the New Jerusalem are hard to kind of wrap my hands around. And Mm. and I think that's because I can only imagine what I know now, what I've experienced here on Mm -hmm. earth. So as we get to heaven, will there be any similarities to what our experiences are now? Oh, there may be. You know, I don't know because I haven't been there yet, but there may be. What I do know is this, that if we have full and complete knowledge, then that full and complete knowledge will enable us to take what is familiar to us now and see the correspondence to what we're looking at at that point. So we're just going to understand now a lot better than we do. It's better in the future to look back and understand the present than it is to be in the present and not understand what's happening around you. So let's think about uh, two things here today. Number one, God wants to be with you in heaven, and he wants you to be there with him. But he also wants you and me not to be bothered in heaven with everything we're bothered with here on earth. So let's kind of separate our thinking. First of all, let's talk about why would God want to be with us, you know? Now, I know why you want to spend eternity with him. My question is, why does he want to spend eternity with you? Here's the good news. The Bible has an answer to that. Let me suggest to you what the Bible says is the answer to the question, why does God want to spend time with you? I think the answer is that it has always been God's stated intent to have you live with him. I mean, that's always the way it's been. God always wanted you to and him to live in the same place. Leviticus chapter 26, verses 11 and 12, he said, I will put my dwelling place among you, and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. See, that's God's desire. It's always been God's desire for us and for him to be together. So why aren't we? It's not his fault. He didn't go anywhere. We moved away from him when we sinned, and the result of that was we put a great gulf between God and us. That was never God's desire. It was never his intention. God will himself live with us in the new heaven and the new earth. In fact, Revelation 21, verse 3, he says, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Three times in one verse, he says God will be with us. It's always been God's stated intent to be with us. Now, that's good news. But it's not because you choose that. It's because God chooses that. He is making it so that you and I can spend all of eternity, not just in heaven, but in heaven with him. And that's the key. So the question still remains, though, why does God want to do this? Why is this his stated intention? Well, just think about the history of God with mankind. God has always wanted to be with us. He's always wanted to be with his creation. He created us in his image, in his likeness, so that we could live together. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And then Adam and Eve sinned. Genesis chapter 3. But before Adam and Eve sinned, it says God walked with Adam and Eve right here on this planet. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. It was only their sin that made them hide from God. He never hid from us. God's always wanted to live with us. And God already has established a precedent. Even though our sin has separated us from God, God said, I'm going to come to you in the person of a baby. Jesus was born so God 
could come to earth. That's what Emmanuel means, God with us. The whole concept of the advent of Christ, the whole concept of Jesus being born in a stable in Bethlehem, that whole concept is based on the fact God did not want this great gulf, this huge gap, this chasm between us and him. He didn't want that to exist. And he knew we couldn't come to him, so he came to us. There's a precedent here. God always has wanted to be with us. God saved me. I don't think God's going to abandon me. And in fact, I'm pretty confident I'm going to enjoy all of eternity, not just because of a street of gold and not because of the great precious stones and the the gate of pearl and that sort of thing. It's not that. I'm going to enjoy all of eternity because God's going to be there. And I remember that he said, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Now, everlasting means it doesn't stop. So the love of God, which he expressed at Calvary, he is going to express to me every day of my life in eternity. Now, may I say a word to you if you haven't really been the object of love? You know, there are many, many people today that had parents that weren't loving kind of people. They may have been good parents, or they may not have been very good parents. But you just never felt really loved. You never had an expression of love. You never had anyone tell you that they loved you. Or if they told you, they never showed it. They disappointed you consistently. When you get to heaven, all that will be behind you forever. Because one of the reasons God wants to be with us is to love us every day of eternity. We even have a fast start already on God being with us even before we get to heaven. Because he sent his son to be with us, to die for us, his Holy Spirit to dwell in us. And the day will come when you and I, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and everyone who has ever believed in God and came to him in faith, trusting his promises, going to feel the presence of a loving God. So why does God want to spend time with you? I think God wants to spend time with you for one reason and only one. That's because he loves you. I love spending time with my grandchildren. Now, I probably love spending time with them more than they love spending time with me. You know, if they would let me, I'd hold them in my arms. Now, they won't let me, but if they would, I'd hold them in my arms. Why? Not because of what they can do for me, but because of how I feel about them. It's not what you can do for God in heaven that's important. What can you do for God? Nothing. It's the fact that he loves you so dearly, he wants to be with you. Now, listen to this. Let me quote several people that you probably will recognize their names. John Milton, the author of Paradise Lost, he put it this way. Thy presence, he says, talking about God, thy presence makes our paradise, and where thou art is heaven. In other words, heaven is wherever God is. Now, God is in a place, so there is a place called heaven. Samuel Rutherford said this, O my Lord Jesus Christ, if I could be in heaven without thee, it would be a hell. And if I could be in hell and still have thee, it would be a heaven to me. For thou art all the heaven I want. I like that. Heaven is heaven because God is there. And Martin Luther said it this way, I had rather be in hell with Christ than be in heaven without him. See, a place without Christ cannot be heaven, and a place with Christ cannot be hell. And that's what all these people are saying. Jonathan Edwards, in one of his great sermons, 1733, that's a long time ago, 1733, Jonathan Edwards said this, God is the highest good of the reasonable creature, and the enjoyment of him is the only happiness with which our souls can be satisfied. To go to heaven fully is to enjoy God. It's infinitely better than the most pleasant accommodations here. Fathers and mothers, husbands, wives, children, or the company of earthly friends are all but shadows. But the enjoyment of God is the substance. These are but scattered beams, but God is the sun. These are but streams, but God is the fountain. These are but drops, but God is the ocean. Now, that's why God wants to spend time with us. We can never be fulfilled in heaven without him. If heaven is where God is, 
and that's true, then hell is where God is not, and that's true. You know what it is that makes hell hell? It's the absence of God. It's the absence of the meaningful presence of God. You know what it is that makes heaven heaven? The meaningful presence of God. The difference is not location. The difference is not temperature, and the difference is not precious metals. The difference is the presence of God. Wherever God is, that's where heaven is. When you're saying we have to do without, (laughs) that implies that there will be things there for us to do. And sometimes, looking back, I've had this vision of heaven of we're going to be doing nothing but praising and worshiping God. You've joked before about how people have this idea of heaven that they're going to be floating on clouds and eating uh, chocolate. (laughs) Or playing their harp. Yes, things like that. And so apparently it's not going to be that way. No, it isn't. Uh, There's going to be lots to do in heaven. Remember, part of our heavenly experience is our relationship to God. I mean, it's nothing like our worship here. It is going to be sincere and real and absolutely tremendous worship. There'll be great singing in heaven. There are too many images of of the angels or others singing in heaven for us not to believe we would not sing in heaven. But we'll also have administrative responsibility in heaven. Uh, We will have a responsibility that Jesus gives us. It's a part of our reward. I think we'll do a lot of traveling while we're in heaven. For those of you who've always wanted to travel and never could afford it, hey, it's going to be free then. Go wherever you want to, you know? So heaven is not a place where you sit around and wonder, why am I spending all my time here? There will be something fresh and new for us all the time, because God is always fresh and new. And he's going to make sure we have all those things that will make heaven, heaven. Well, I'll be back in just a minute. We want to talk a little bit about what you and I have to do without in heaven. If God makes heaven, heaven, what is it that he keeps from us that makes it good, too? We'll talk about that in just a minute. More in a moment with Dr. Kroll here on Back to the Bible. Well, it's summer, and for a lot of people, it's a busy time with vacations and baseball games, trips to the swimming pool. And we realize you might not catch all of Dr. Kroll's messages in his series on Revelation. Well, we don't want you to miss any pieces of the puzzle to this tough book. So why don't you call us today and order Dr. Kroll's Revelation series on CD. That's all 40 messages for you to hear at your convenience. You'll get eight weeks worth of messages on 16 CDs for just 35 bucks. That is 17 hours worth of teaching time. And the great news is you'll have all the pieces to the Revelation puzzle in one place. And then you won't have to miss any of Dr. Kroll's teaching, no matter how busy your summer schedule is. So to order Dr. Kroll's entire Revelation series on CD, call us today at 1-800-759-2425. Again, that's 1-800-759-2425. Or you can write to us at Back to the Bible, Box 82808, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68501. That's Back to the Bible, Box 82808, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68501. And of course, our website is always open. It's backtothebible.org. Now, when you contact us, be sure to ask for this month's free Meet with God devotional. It's called The Future in God's Hands. It's a great short guide full of insights into the book of Revelation. Now, let's go back to Wood. We've talked about the new heavens and the new earth, and I'm sitting here thinking, what can you tell us about our glorified bodies? What will we be like? The one thing I know about the glorified body is it doesn't die, it doesn't decay, it doesn't hurt, it doesn't need showers and deodorant, it doesn't need to brush its teeth, you know, it just, we'll never need a haircut. You take all the things that sin brings to the body today that you don't like. And I related some of those things. All of those are going to be gone. Our bodies are going to be the kind of body where we can be wherever we need to be. Again, I don't think traveling to distant points in the universe is going to be a prolonged process. I think we'll be able to move freely throughout the universe. Jesus moved freely through um, solid objects. 
I don't think I'm going to spend the first couple of million years in heaven just walking through doors to prove I can do it. That'll get old in a hurry. But I probably can do it, you know. So what is described for us in 1 Corinthians 15 is that we have a glorified body that is like Jesus' body and that is not hindered by any of the things that hinder our bodies today. And one of the things we're going to have to do without in heaven are all the things we don't like about what's wrong with our body today. Well, let's think about the things we have to do without in heaven. I know most people think of heaven as having everything. But there are things are not going to be in heaven. Look at uh, chapter 21 again, verse 1. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So the first thing you have to do without is today's heaven and today's earth. But we have a better one. Why would we want this one? Secondly, he says, also there's no more sea. Isn't that interesting? The sea is the place where marine life lives. It's a place where you go fishing, you go sailing, but it also keeps people apart, doesn't it? None of you here in the United States have ever driven to Europe, and you never will until you get to heaven. Now, you may not need a car at that point, but he says the sea is gone. That which separates us will not separate us anymore in heaven. But what I really want you to see is verse 4. This is one of my favorite verses in all of the book of Revelation. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Now there's a list you can live with. No more crying. No more reason to cry. No more disappointment, so there's no more crying. No more death. You're in a glorified body. No more death. He's going to wipe away all the tears. There'll be no more tears. Even the possibility of death will be gone. You won't fall ill in heaven. You won't trip and stumble and stub your toe and and die as a result in heaven. None of that is a possibility. God is even going to eliminate sorrow in heaven. There won't be anything for you to be sad about. In fact, Isaac Watts writes joyfully in his Joy to the World, No more let sins and sorrows grow. So, if there's no sin in heaven, there's no sorrow, which is the natural accompaniment to sin. And then he says, God's presence is going to eradicate all pain. Now, just think about this. How many prescriptions you have right now, how many over-the-counter pain relief medicines you have right now, that one day you can kiss goodbye forever, because there'll be no more pain. I can hardly wait. Notice in chapter 21, verse 22, it says, But I saw no temple in heaven, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Now, we don't need a house of worship today. It's good to have one because it's a place where people can gather. But in heaven, we have immediate and constant access to the Father. Why would we need a temple? So there's no temple in heaven. Notice in verse 23 of the same chapter, the city had no need of the sun or the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it, and the Lamb is its light. Now, it doesn't actually say there's no sun. It doesn't actually say there's no moon. It just says they aren't necessary. So it doesn't say these things are going to be removed. It just says the need for those things will be removed because God himself, the glory of God, that Shekinah glory of God, is more than enough to illuminate the entire universe of God. Now, every time the Shekinah glory is talked about, it's veiled somehow. The, the full radiance of this glory is kept back from us. One day, the artificial means to physically light our world will be taken away forever. And then look at verse 25. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And when he says again, there shall be no night there, I think it means that the things that night brings to us will be gone forever. Night brings the need for sleep. Night brings sometimes terror. Night brings concern. If you're living all alone, the hardest point in your 24-hour day is the nighttime. There will be no night there. Now, it does talk about the glory of God and the light of the sun not necessary. It also talks about the gates not being shut during the day. And since there's no night there, there's no terror as associated with night, there's no reason for the gates ever to be shut. So there are lots of things about this heaven that we're going to have to do without. 
I mean, just put these on the sticky side of your mind as we go today. When you get to heaven, you're going to have to do without crying. When you get to heaven, you're going to have to do without pain. When you get to heaven, you're going to have to do without sorrow. When you get to heaven, you're going to have to do without death. You know what? I think I can do this. (laughs) Given a little time to think about it, I think I can handle all that. Sometimes when I'm out speaking, I talk about this verse and I say, there'll be no pain, there'll be no crying, no sorrow. There'll be no dentists in heaven. I had a dentist come to me after a service one time and said, wait a minute. So I have to say that differently. There'll be no dentist who will ply their trade in heaven. There may be dentists there. They're just going to find new work when they get to heaven. That's what makes heaven heaven. Not that there's a lack of pain, but that there's the presence of God. Not that there's a lack of sorrow, but there's the presence of God. See, when you are in the presence of God, all these other things Just have a way of filtering out of your life. So can you wait? Well, you have to wait, but let's hope we don't have to wait very long. Yeah, you may have answered it, but when you talk about no sorrow and no tears, and yet you're bound to be aware of family members and friends that are not there. Mm -hmm. Did you notice he didn't say they wouldn't exist? He said God will wipe them away. I'm going to guess by that, that when we get to heaven and immediately realize that our last opportunity to witness for the Lord, our last opportunity to serve him for anything that would bring eternal reward, it's gone forever. So at the judgment seat of Christ, which I understand to be immediately after the rapture of the church, I think there'll be a lot of sorrow at the judgment seat. I think there'll be a lot of pain. I think there'll be a lot of tears. And God will say, it's okay. And he'll wipe them away. And we'll never see them again. So the thoughts that would bring to us sorrow and pain and tears are thoughts that will be removed from us when the guilt of what we may or may not have done is also removed from us at the judgment seat of Christ. Well, I hope you've enjoyed Dr. Kroll's series on Revelation here on Back to the Bible. You know, we've tried to do what we can to help you better understand this confusing book by offering resources to go along with Wood's messages. But you may be thinking, I wish I could just hear him teach it all again. You know what? You're in luck because you can. We've put together Dr. Cole's whole message series on Revelation in one CD set. That's 40 messages on 12 CDs. So if you've missed a few messages or you simply want to hear Dr. Kroll teach it one more time, you can do it. Now that's 16 CDs, about 17 hours of teaching time, and it's yours for only $35. You know, that's just a little over $2 a CD. It's a pretty incredible value. Now there are a variety of ways that you can use this series on Revelation. You can use it for your own devotional time with your small group or maybe a Bible study at church. Another option is to use the series with your kids to help them make sense of all those confusing images and the events from Revelation. Or you might have a friend that could benefit from the series. However you choose to use it, I know that you'll love owning this complete set of Dr. Cole's messages from Revelation. So call and order your set today. It's really easy. To order the Revelation message series, just call us at 1-800-759-2425. That's 1-800-759-2425, or drop us a line at Back to the Bible, Box 82808, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68501. Again, that's Back to the Bible, Box 82808, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68501. Now, you can also order your CD set online at backtothebible.org. Now, let's go back to Wood. Well, we have spent now uh, almost eight weeks in studying the book of Revelation, and tomorrow we come to the final message of the Bible, the final message of this book. And it's a call from God for you to come to Him. I think it's a tender passage, and I think you're going to enjoy the final study of the book of Revelation. That's tomorrow, right here on Back to the Bible. Plan now to join me, won't you? Thanks for being here today. God bless you. I'm Woodrow Kroll. Have a good and godly day.